you are manifesting a life. Are you manifesting a positive life? Well, that's a choice. You want to manifest a negative life? That's a choice. But if you start manifesting, then the, the cascade of consequences of that are going to manifest in the process. So if you put in these really great habits, you can... You'd have to feel those emotions before the experience occurred. And if you understood that you could dissociate all of your attention from this three-dimensional reality and have no attention on anything known and understand it's the field that creates matter, mm. not matter that emits the field. And if you could get to that place and change your energy with a clear intention and elevated emotion, your heart starts beating in this beautiful rhythm like a drum. We've measured it so many times and when that occurs. Why do you think so many people center their identity with being a victim? And why do you think they hold on to it so tightly when they know they could reprogram their beliefs and start living in accordance with a harmonious life and being the creator and manifester as opposed to the victim who is powerless. Yeah. Well, I think the biggest thing, some people say, oh yeah, you can change your life. And then they find it's very difficult. It's very hard. I go, why? Because they don't know how to push the record button. Uh, right. You know, and well, so many of them are talking to themselves. I'm going to make Bruce, you do better. You just do better about this. You do better. And I go, Okay, let's stop for a second. Who am I asking to do better? Oh, my subconscious. I go, oh, there's nobody in there. <laughs> Who are you talking to? Nobody. I go, well, that's a big waste of time, man, because uh, that's not where change comes from. They don't know how to push that button. If you don't know how to push the button, it's frustrating. And it says, oh, it takes so, it's so much hard work to change. It's not easy. It takes time. The, these are belief systems. Why? Because they try and it doesn't work. I go, that's because they didn't know how to push the record button. So mm. most people say, well, yeah, I can change, but it's not working. They said think positive, and I thought positive, and it didn't work. It's not working, yeah. No, because the idea was you can think all you want, but the problem is while you're thinking, you're actually playing the negative program. <laughs> so you can, thinking about being positive is actually creating the negative problem because you're not paying attention when you're thinking about being positive. So th th this is the whole issue. People have a feeling that they can change, but they have no effort. They don't want to get in the game because they feel it's, uh, you know, it's just too much time and it doesn't work. And I tried it and it didn't work. And then they give up and then life just goes on. It's seamless. You, you don't see it. It's just the way you've been living it <laughs> ever since seven years old. You've been just living this program. If someone had only said, you know what, I'm a victim, I've got, too much going on. I don't have time to do these new program things you're talking about. The record button seems like too much work. It's it's exhausting. I've tried and started and stopped so many times with health, money, relationships, whatever it might be, and I'm a failure at all these things. If you could only give people a five-minute thing to do every day, and you said it, just focus on this five minutes a day <laughs> well, that, to, get you, to, get you start, to get you started. Well, the get, the get you, know, you started is this. If you like, like the first time that I really started to be aware that my my subconscious was controlling me was uh, when I was in my car, stopped at a red light and I realized I was going to be late. And then all of a sudden I started berating myself. Well, you can't do things right. You're not oh, good you enough. You're an idiot. You're such an idiot. Yeah, how do you forget these things? It yeah. was that moment that I said, wait, I'm listening to what these words are. I'm actually stopping. I'm not just saying the words. I'm saying the words, but I'm actually listening. I said, well, how many positive things did I just say? Zero. Uh-oh, <laughs> there's a problem right there. And I started to realize we have to stop and be conscious just long enough to listen to these things. They flow through just continuously. you got to stop and just tune in and say, what am I thinking? Why? Because if you start to realize that most of your thoughts are negative, and this is not good enough, that won't work, blah, blah, blah. And I said, but that's a creative voice you're talking about right there. Mm -hmm. That voice is creating, and everything you just said is now part of your creation. So what if you stopped? What if you just uh, said, wait, that what I did is I just covered up the clock on my car so I didn't have to see how late I was going to be, and I got there on the right time. <laughs> it's like, why? Because I didn't focus on you know all the steps between here and the destination. I just said, I got to get there. Boom, I was there. That's how it worked. Okay. So what can a person do? I think the first time is just for them to wake up long enough to hear, are, are you giving yourself positive vision of a future? Or are you already canceled the future with, with negative things that you can bring up any number of negative things? 
it's not going to happen because of X, fill in X. You can put anything in there. It's not going to happen. I go, until you understand, oh, my God, I am not thinking a positive thought in this process. Well, then I'm not, if I'm not thinking a positive pro- thought, then I don't want those other thoughts to manifest. <laughs> mm-hmm. And that was a wake-up call. Uh, I, should we, is there a place where we should, where negative thinking is a positive? Can't say it because it's yeah. a delusion. It's a delusion. It's not the reality of negative thinking uh, besides manifesting it as a reality. Mm-hmm. It's only, and now you are manifesting. Well, that was, when do you want to stop manifesting? I say, when you stop long enough to correct yourself, no, I don't want to think that. No, let me think something positive. Let, let me assure you something. A while back, I, I would have been what loosely called manic depressive. I'd be happy most of the time, and then something would go wrong, and then the next thing would go wrong, and I, I would go in a spiral, and then it got worse, and I'd get down and be totally depressed, you know, giving myself self-talk bad criticism, not smart enough, not good enough, whatever. And I was... Uh, uh, engage this was like a repetitive process i you know once it starts it's like oh here we go you know it's gonna go and i was in my lab doing something and it required so much work to get this done and and then there was the part where i prepared the experiment then i'm going to run the experiment takes like two hours to prepare and then i start to run it and if you mess up a little bit the whole thing goes to Mm -hmm. and i so i did it the first time went to crap and it's like oh god it's got to spend two more hours putting it all back together again weigh out all the stuff do everything get it ready I ruined it the second time. Third time really put me off because now I've spent over six hours of the day not, <laughs> repeating an experiment that never worked. And I got real mad at myself and I went into that. You idiot, you can't do anything right. And it was cool. I was alone in the room. And I hear a voice just right out in front of me somewhere, right out there. And that voice says, don't you have anything better to do than to listen to this? Wow. And I, for a moment, I was stunned. Like, I'm the only one in the room. You know, it was my higher self mm. looking at me, going through this and saying, Don't you have anything better? And I, I laughed. That's kind of funny. I said, Sure. I'd rather go see a movie. And there was a newspaper. <laughs> I picked it up, found a movie, went to the movie, came out clear. No more depression. Gone. Okay. The next time I started to go down, I, I remembered that. Don't I have anything better to do? I started to laugh, immediately changed, just went and did something else, stopped. It was a choice. I could continue going back and forth with that or with the choice was do something else. And I did it. Guess what? After a number of times, not too many, I never got depressed again because this really? made a habit that if I would start in that direction, the habit was go do something else. And that has been now a valid part of my whole life i carry nothing forward on this anymore uh, and, and this was like the freedom if you're living with yourself and you are you believe you're unlovable then you're living with your an unlovable self all day long and you're gonna be anxious probably stressed worried what are people thinking about me i'm not good enough other people don't think i'm good enough i'm not going to be accepted They're and that's the conscious me. thinking mind right and while you're thinking what's running the show the, the problem that you're thinking about, <laughs> yeah, exactly. thinking about it. And while I'm thinking, now the problem is running while I'm thinking about it. And as a as a you know cell biologist and researcher yeah. on science, what happens to our physical cells in the material world when the mind subconsciously and consciously is directing negative energy and thoughts towards it? Self sabotage. You are manifesting a life. Are you manifesting a positive life? Well, that's a choice. You want to manifest a negative life? That's a choice. But if you start manifesting, then the the cascade of consequences of that are going to manifest in the process. It's a choice. People don't believe it's a choice because they get so carried away with it without looking at themselves saying, hey, wait, this is a moment of choice. That's why that voice, it woke me up, took me out of this lifetime of that Mm. because once it said that, uh, it was funny. It was so funny that anytime I started to go down, I started laughing and then stop. And then the point was, the never. Uh, it's been years, years since I've had any anger issues at all. Really? 
Yes. So you used years. to you used to be a lot you used to be a lot angrier or used to be well, reactive. Well, things weren't life. working. I was more frustrated most of the time because right. things weren't working the way I wanted them to work. Now it's like, are you kidding me? I, I'm like this happy camper. Hey, I'm awake. Guess what? I have another day here, another day to experience. I have no idea what's going to happen. I send out some good things, and then good things come back. Great. This is a great life. This is not an accident. I know this from a scientific point of view because I'm very clear of my first 40 plus years with those programs that I got from my family, creating the problem that my family has. You know, my brother's uh, cancer and shit like that, excuse me, but, you know, uh, I go, why? The same family, they just kept the programming of that. So and it's not I, genetic, okay. it's programming. 100%. Yeah. 100%. What are some what are some daily affirmations you started to implement when you saw this depressed thoughts coming in or these self-sabotage thoughts coming in? How, what did you shift it with affirmations, with different thoughts? What did you start to uh, say? It was just the awareness, A, that, you know, as I said, the very first stop light where I started all of a sudden listen while I'm waiting for the light. It was like the first time I tuned in and go, what the hell are you thinking? That was the most important thing, because then the habit of not going there anymore, starting to realize, uh oh, this is why am I thinking this negative thing? Turn around, make a positive statement right now, because that negative one is taking you on the and just a repetition of this behavior become habitual. So and habits are great. Why? No effort. I love habits. Why? You don't even have to think about them. They do it automatically, you know. So if you put in these really great habits, you can walk through the day and think anything you want, do anything you want. And your habit, if they're good ones, will just guide you perfectly through here without even being involved with thinking. Mm. Ah, that's the game. The game is what is heaven to you? Then program that that's your life. And then guess what? The 95% of the day manifesting heaven while well, you're not even thinking about it. And for those listening or watching saying, you know, Bruce, this sounds great and all, but I've heard the positive thinking and changing your thoughts stuff a million times, and I've tried it before and it hasn't worked for me. How can you prove on a scientific level that this actually is not woo-woo land, but it's actually scientific well, evidence? Uh, well, the one that, get, that was real important for me, because I, I knew the experience of Psyche helped me, but I had no awareness of what or how. I said, oh, that was cool. That was nice. But when I saw the results that Jeff Fannin showed of, of recording the activity while the process was going on, it's like, oh, well, of this the brain of, of the, the brain. brain. Yeah, yeah. This, this is a real function. This is a real action. This is not a suggestion. <laughs> this is a mechanism. Uh, and then that gave more positive character to me to follow through because I saw this is just not coincidence stuff, man. This is manifestation. Uh, and, and we have that opportunity to manifest. But to many people, their belief system about that is they're the victim and I'm stuck and that's the way it is. That's my life and my genes did this and therefore I'm I'm, I'm going to die and, and all this kind of, and it's like, wow, <laughs> you are now a machine and you're going to play that right out to the very end and it will happen just as you thought it would. What happens if we create, try to create from survival emotions? It just takes a long time. And you just, you, you'll just force it. Here, little, yeah. spin, little steps at a time. You'll force it. Yeah. You'll, you'll force it. You'll fight for it. You'll compete for it. And you'll manipulate. You'll cheat. You'll lie. Uh, you'll do anything to get what you want because that's what matter does when it's trying to change matter. And everybody's, everybody's playing that game, right? Everybody's trying to c accumulate the most amount of things. Mm, right. Okay, so that's what abundance means to certain people. Get as many things as you can. Okay. Do you want that? Not a problem. But let's learn the formula of how to create, right? Yes. So then, So then you'd have to feel those emotions before the experience occurred. And if you understood that you could dissociate all of your attention from this three-dimensional reality and have no attention on anything known and understand that it's the field that creates matter, mm -hmm. not matter that emits the field. And if you could get to that place and change your energy with a clear intention and elevated emotion, your heart starts beating in this beautiful rhythm like a drum. We've measured it so many times. And when that occurs, the next thing that happens, the heart informs the brain it's safe to create now. So the person Gosh. relaxes into the present moment. And then we see this, like if you took a big sheet, you know, and a blanket and you went like that, the energy of the heart actually 
informs the brain to move into these beautiful, elegant states of alpha brainwave patterns, mm. coherent alpha. And that's saying, what's the next dream? What is it the next, what's the next opportunity you want to experience? That's a state of creation. So now you have a Wi-Fi signal. You got a coherent brain, that's a directive, that's a signal out, and you got this coherent heart. That's what draws it to us, right? You combine those two, and if there's a vibrational match between your energy and that potential in the quantum field, and you're feeling abundant, and whatever your brain associates with being abundant, that's your call. That's what the creative process is. This is the creative center. The brain, the frontal lobe, actually says, what would it be like to be creative or, or abundant? I don't know what it'd be like to be abundant. Well, then go read a few books on people who, who actually became abundant and realized it wasn't a glorious process. They mm. failed miserably. They, let, they got betrayed. They learned a lot of lessons, but they persevered. Mm -hmm. And what are the qualities of that person that you could embody? That, that's the key, right? Because it's, it's not about wealth. It's who you become, mm -hmm. right? Because people think it's about their wealth, but it's the becoming process. It's the overcoming. That attracted that, right? Of course. So then, so then, you got to turn the battleship around because most people say, "I can't feel grateful for my wealth because it hasn't happened yet." That's the hypnosis, waiting for the experience to happen to feel grateful. Well, that's Newtonian. That's three-dimensional reality. That's cause and effect. The quantum, you got to feel it in order for you to experience it. Okay, so this heart becomes like an amplifier and it sends that signal out and that frequency can carry the thought of your abundance. Can't, suffering cannot carry the thought of your abundance. Lack cannot carry the thought of your abundance. It's, it's a different frequency, right? We feel different feelings like suffering. We think different thoughts, right? So, so people can say, I'm abundant, I'm abundant, I'm abundant, I'm abundant, all they want, but that thought is never making it to the body because it's stopping at the brainstem because the body's saying, I'm miserable. I'm unhappy, mm -hmm. I'm in lack, right? So, so the affirmation doesn't work, right? Okay, so let's go one step further. Yes. So if you practice this and you actually understood, you know, well, well we teach this pretty well, but if you, you, if you learned it just like learning how to play handball or mm -hmm. learning how to hit a golf ball, learning how to dance a salsa, so you just practice the form, you got really good at it. If you were doing it properly then, what would be the outcome? The experiment of being abundant would be that you would have to feel that feeling. It's so good at doing it with your eyes closed. Mm -hmm. You gotta do it with your eyes open. Now why? <laughs> because if you're feeling the feelings of your emotions, of your future, you're no longer looking for them. Because you you're in the future now. Your, your body is so objective that it's believing it's living in that reality yes. where you are abundant. And as long as you feel that emotion, you're not separate from it any longer. You're no longer in lack. You're no longer looking for it to occur, occur. Say, why hasn't it happened yet? If you're feeling abundant, why would you look? Right? You, you, you right. Wouldn't, so, so, so then our job then is to be able to maintain that modified state of mind and body. So, okay. So does that mean like you should check your bank account tomorrow and see if there's a half a million dollars in it? No. You keep tuning into that potential, and then here come the synchronicities. Yes. What's that? That's feedback in your environment. It's the universe saying, hey, Lewis, whatever you're doing, all of a sudden, <laughs> we are starting to create, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it's so important for people to remember that they're the creators of their lives instead of the victim of their lives, mm -hmm. right? So the victim is saying, I'm feeling this way because that person or that circumstance or I don't have any money is causing me to feel this way. That's my relationship with money. What that really means is I'm using my lack to reaffirm my dependency, my addiction, my conditioning. That's my relationship with money is that I put my attention on money because I don't have it. Mm. So the relationship with money is of course built on lack. And so when they don't have it, they feel bad. And what they're really saying is my outer environment, my reality is actually controlling the way I feel and the way I think. So Lewis, why are you in a good mood today? Things are going good. Why in a bad mood? Things are going bad today. So. This unconscious program of victimization is saying that, that, that we're, we're allowing our environment to influence the way we feel and the way we think. Isn't that, isn't that what victimization is? And, and the stronger the emotion we have to our lack, the more we put our attention on the fact that we don't have it, right? Yeah. So then the person has forgotten that they're creating reality because what they're creating is lack. And they're creating more of it. And then they try harder and they force harder and they control more. And they're more, more. exhausted and, and their more. body's tired. And, and they're breaking down. And, right. So, 
So the experiment then is, let's try it another way. Let's create from the field instead of from matter. Get a coherent heart, get a coherent brain, relax in the heart, and energy moves right into the brain. We've measured this a thousand times. And all of a sudden, the person moves into these beautiful, elegant brainwave states where they're super creative, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the longer you're conscious of that energy, the more you draw that future to you. So then, what does the synchronicity mean? It means whatever you're doing inside of you is producing that effect outside of you. Pay attention to what you did. Keep doing and do more it again. Yeah. So generate a little bit more abundance. Just uh -huh. do it for an experiment. Now, when the synchronicity happens, do you think you feel suffering or do you think you feel a little excitement? You feel inspired, right? Mm -hmm. So then that synchronicity is saying, use this energy, use this feeling. It should be easier for you to feel this now and go back and do it again. Mm -hmm. Keep the experiment going. Then here comes the promotion. Here comes the, here comes the email. Here mm -hmm. comes the person you meet at the right time, yes. right? Whoa, we have something happening here. And then that, that becomes the momentum, right? So then we generate abundance. That's, that's how we do it. And the relationship... It doesn't just happen by accident. We generate it. We generate abundance, right? So then if you have an hour meditation where you're tuning into your abundant future, but then you're spending the other 15 hours a day in lack, don't expect anything to change. You defaulted. Mm -hmm. You're back to the old energy. And if you say it's that person or that circumstance or that bank account, I'm going to say you're back to the unconscious program of being a victim, right? Mm -hmm. so, then, so, then, so then let's go a step further. If your personality creates your personal reality, and it does, and your personality is made up of how you think, how you act, and how you feel, then the present personality who's listening to this podcast has created the present personal reality called their life. Nothing big there. Which means if you want to change your personal reality, you're going to have to change your personality. Right. Nothing changes in your life until you change, right? Mm -hmm. So then 95% of who we are is, is on autopilot, right? It's, it's a programmed thoughts, hardwired thoughts, beliefs, perceptions, unconscious habits and behaviors, and really, really emotional responses that tend to be really knee-jerk and automatic, right? So. If 95% of who we are is a set of unconscious programs, then the first step to change is becoming conscious of those unconscious thoughts. Now, people think when they sit down to do the work and make their change that they're, they're doing something wrong. No, those thoughts have to come up. I can, I'm not worthy, it's never going to work. But the person who's truly persevering towards their abundance realizes just because they have that thought doesn't mean it's true. They're curious on what's on the other side of that thought. Ah, well, that's just the thought, right? Mm -hmm. And nerve cells that no longer fire together, no longer wire together. So you keep moving past that thought, it, gets, it has less and less power over you, right? Uh, now, you're, you have power over it, or, or better, better yet, you're using your brain in the proper way instead of your, being a victim to your brain, sure. right? If you complain about money, if you judge people who have it, if you rush when you're in lack, if you cheat when you don't have what you need, an abundant person doesn't do that. You got to look at that and say, I got to break these habits. Yes. Oh my God, if I truly want to be abundant, I can't act this way. Now, here's the big one. <laughs> if, if I truly want to be a new personality that's in a new personal reality, I can't take lack with me. I can't take unworthiness. I can't take the story that goes along with it with my parents or my grandparents mm -hmm. or, or my ex or whatever. That story has to end, right? I mean, if not now, when, right? How do people end those stories? Well, of course. Well, how many times do we have to forget until we stop forgetting and start remembering? Right. That's the game, right? Mm -hmm. That's the game called change. How many times do we have to go unconscious and default to that old personality when we catch ourselves and stop doing that and get conscious? That's the moment of change. Mm -hmm. So. The problem is, is that most people wake up in the morning and they think, uh, let me think of my problems, right? The, the brain is a record of the past, right? So they think about their problems. They don't have enough money. And those, those problems are usually connected to certain people at certain places mm -hmm. with certain objects and certain things. What didn't work time. out or who screwed right. me so, over. Or so yeah. the moment they wake up, the moment they remember those problems, they're thinking in the past. Mm. So now they're firing and wiring the memory. They're keeping the memory of the past alive in their mind. The problem is every one of those memories has an emotion associated with it because we've experienced it. So when they feel the lack, when they feel the unhappiness, when they feel the anxiety, now the body's in the past. 
Thoughts being the language of the brain, feelings being the language of the body, how we think and how we feel creates our state of being. But the conditioning process starts because conditioning only needs a thought and a feeling, a memory or an image and an emotion and a stimulus and a response, and you're conditioning your body to become mm. the mind of that emotion. And now the, the memory's not in the brain. Now the memory's buried subconsciously in the body, and the body becomes the mind of that emotion. So the body is living in lack, and it's believing. It's the body is. The, is that through the nervous system, or is that through, through neurochemical the cells? Everything. everything. So the so so the body's so objective that it does not know the difference between the real life experience that's creating the lack and the emotion that you're creating by thought alone called lack. Mm. The body's believing it's living the same past experience every day. It's a, it, it, why? Because the end product of an experience is an emotion. Mm -hmm. oh, well, if you uh, your life is changing, but you're still feeling lack, don't expect anything that you you won't even see it. You'll walk right past it. You're viewing your life through the lens of the past. Okay, so okay, so then a person realizes that all their friends are making money and they're doing stuff, and they're like, "Wow, I'm really feeling lack now." So then, when it no longer <laughs> becomes about your abundance, and it becomes about your change. That's a valuable moment when it's no longer about your healing, but it's about your change. I paid attention to a lot of people in, in the last couple of years tell their story. The people who heal in this work from cancers and all kinds of chronic health conditions and Parkinson's and strokes and paralysis and all kinds of things, it's rare genetic disorders. It, it never was about, when they've really got in the game, it was never about their healing. It was about what do I need to change in order to heal. When the game goes like that, so then the person who's feeling lack, on some level or another, it's not just in the mind, it's in the body, right? So let, me say, let me hear you say that again. When someone's looking for abundance, it's never about the abundance, it's about the change they need to make for no, healing? No, the, the change. Well, I'm using healing as an example, yes. but let's use abundance as an example. Yes. When, when you understand that you cannot get abundant, when it's no longer about the game called abundance, it's about the game called change. Mm -hmm. What do I need to change? The more I change, the more I'll be abundant. Yes. So then it's no longer, well, I haven't, how come it hasn't happened? That's the old personality, separate mm -hmm. from the experience, still in lack, asking that question. Which is creating your current reality. Which is, which is reaffirming it because that's the lens you're perceiving it through. Okay, mm -hmm. so. So we should be focusing more on what we need to change every moment as opposed to the abundance or the healing. Well, the word meditation means to become familiar with. Sit with yourself long enough and not turn on your cell phone, not mm -hmm. scroll through your social media, do no TikTok, no emails, no, none of that stuff. Don't just sit and close your eyes and, and watch the thoughts that come up. Those, that's the exact reason why you're not abundant. Watch what you want to do when you're feeling lack to take away the lack and there's always something you would do to, to take it away. But, but sit with the lack and be curious on what's on the other side of it, mm -hmm. right? Because the body's programmed into lack now subconsciously, right? So the emotion of lack drives our thoughts and drives our behaviors. So it makes sense then that if an emotion is a record of the past, then we're doing things habitually from the past. Mm -hmm. We're thinking in the past, right? So, so lower the volume to the emotion every time you notice lack comes up. And just like breaking any addiction, there's gonna be cravings, right? So the body's going, <laughs> yeah. hey, Lewis, it's been about two hours since you're you You're so used to doing this so, Yeah, thing. you've been thinking lacking thoughts about 150,000 times a day and you're just gonna stop <laughs> the body's gonna The body's gonna start influencing the mind and saying, yes. it's not gonna work, you're a loser, it didn't work before, it's too hard, or everybody else. That's, that's why it's so hard for people to like lose weight or get in shape same, because you might try it for a few days and then the cravings, or I'm tired, and I want to go default back into the old personality. Right, because why? Because the body, which has been conditioned, the mind, the body is the unconscious mind. So the body's got used to the familiar feeling. Even mm -hmm. They don't even know it's lack. It's just how they feel. So it's not do, guilt. So, okay, right. so let me finish. How does so, yeah, okay, ahead. so the hardest part about all of this is making a different choice. And the moment you decide to make a different choice, get ready, it's going to feel uncomfortable. 
Right. It's going to feel unfamiliar. Your your body's all of a sudden saying, "Hey, Lewis, uh, why don't you start thinking those same exact thoughts, mm -hmm. do the same things, make the same choices, demonstrate the same behaviors, have the same experiences?" So you could feel that feeling of lack. Complain again to somebody. Call somebody up and say how how miserable your right. life is. Right. <laughs> and that's that's the known. Right. So the body is always influencing the mind to return back to the familiar territory. The default. Yeah. The default. Okay. All right. So now the person says. Okay, what thoughts do I not want? What, what would an abundant person think this way? The people in our work that have mm. created, I had a guy come to our event. I, I love this guy. He healed himself. Of, he, he tried to take his life three times. When he, he told me that when he came to our work, he didn't have $2 to rub together. He's worth hundreds of millions of dollars wow. now. And just keeps giving it away. Wow. His, his lesson, his lesson was, no, it wasn't the wealth, it was who he became. So it's the overcoming process that is the becoming process. Right? Who did he become in that journey? Exactly. He had to get beyond all of those thoughts of his past, all the mistakes he made, all the things he did wrong, all the money he owed there, all of that. That was like, he just had to no longer be that person any longer. Mm -hmm. But he did say, how would a wealthy person live? And, and, and when he created his wealth, what do you think the first thing he did? Started giving? Giving it away. Why? Because an abundant person doesn't have any lack. Mm -hmm. And he knows how to create more of it. And that's, he's in the experiment. Well, what would happen if I keep giving it away? He keeps getting more. That's a good experiment to have because he is actually living in that abundant state. He also had tremendous healings taking place because when you heal your heart, you heal your mind. I mean, it's just the way it is. We saw it so many times, right? So he healed his heart. He got an wow. upgrade. He got an upgrade, right? Yeah. So then the, the next fundamental question is, how would an abundant person think? Write it down, dude, and fire and wire those thoughts in your brain and install the hardware. Keep doing it with attention and intention. It becomes the new voice in your head. It becomes a software program. Then say, okay. How am I going to be in my life today? What would an abundant person, how would they behave? And before you reach for your cell phone and start scrolling through your social media, close your eyes and rehearse in your mind how that person would walk, how they would breathe, how they would smile, how they would mm -hmm. greet people, how they would be on Zoom calls, how would they be in traffic, how would they be at dinner? And, and the act of closing your eyes and mentally rehearsing the act, mm -hmm. if you're truly present, the brain does not know the difference between the real life experience and what you're imagining. In fact, just a little bit of time, you start to install the neurological hardware to look like you already did it. Now the mm -hmm. brain is no longer a record of the past, it's primed for the future. Keep doing it, keep rehearsing. No different than playing an instrument, no different than learning how to dance, no different than learning how to act uh, or play a sport. Everybody's mm -hmm. always rehearsing, right? The rehearsal process changes the brain to look like you've already done it, you've already experienced it. Now, what's the essential part of that? The hardware is in place. Now, all you gotta do is step into the footprint. Mm. You keep doing it, it becomes a software program. You start acting like an abundant person. Everything changes, your energy changes, your mood changes, the way you walk, the way you breathe, your posture changes, you're out of the known, right? Yes. You gotta condition the body now emotionally into the future. Can't open your eyes in the morning until you are feeling worthy to receive. And if you can't feel worthy to receive, then if not now, when? Mm -hmm. If it takes you two hours to get there, ask me if it's worth 30 years of running, trying to get what you need matter to matter. Okay, so then the person who wrestles with their lack, they're out of the bleachers and they're on the playing field. Yeah. Here's what we learned. Here's what we learned. Let's go back to beliefs now. So remember, a belief is just a thought you keep thinking over and over again. A belief is something that you keep thinking enough times that you hardwired in your brain and it becomes an automatic program. And we have beliefs about all kinds of things, money, relationships, God, whatever it is. It's all based on what we've been told or our past experiences, right? The boundaries of those beliefs are our emotions, right? So let's just say you got betrayed or somebody abused you or mm -hmm. your father told you that money was bad and there's never enough of it or whatever. That's a story, okay? But, but somehow it left an impression on you. Remember that event very clearly and that's kind of rooted in who you are, right? 
Okay, so that emotion then is the boundary of our belief, okay? So how you think and how you feel creates your state of being. If you take a thought and a feeling, 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 that's called an attitude. A series of good <laughs> thoughts with a series of good feelings, you say, I have a good attitude today. You have a series of negative thoughts that are connected to a series of negative feelings, you say, I have a bad attitude today. So attitudes are just shortened states of being. Good attitude in the morning, bad attitude in the afternoon. If you take an attitude, an attitude, an attitude, and you keep those up, and you string attitudes together, you create what's called a belief. Mm -hmm. And a belief is just an extended state of being. So if you keep thinking the same thought, you keep hardwiring it in the brain, you keep feeling the same feeling, you keep conditioning in your body, the redundancy of that cycle over and over again conditions the body to subconsciously become the mind of that belief. And all beliefs are subconscious states of being. Mm. Okay. Take a belief, a belief, a belief, and you string them together. You form what's called a perception. And perceptions are just such extended states of being that they we're unconscious. And so then we, we edit out reality. In fact, most people don't see things the way they are. They see things the way they are. Yes. Right? And people are always filling in reality unconsciously based on their memory. They could be married to a person for 40 years and they don't see the person, they see the memory of the person, right? Mm -hmm. And there's research to prove this, okay? So how do we change a belief or perception about ourselves or our lives, okay? We've studied this. Okay, let's just say that lack is ingrained in there. You got the story, you lived on the streets, you lost everything, you got betrayed, your business partner took everything, took your wife, took, you got the story in the half, yes. okay? Okay, you got to start telling a new story of the future, right? You got to believe in that future more than you have to believe in the past. So how do you do that? Mm -hmm. You only believe in the past when you feel the emotions of the past. The only time you're going to believe in the future is when you feel the emotions of the future, right? Okay. So in order for us to change a belief or perception about ourselves and our lives, we have to make a decision with such firm intention that the amplitude of that decision carries a level of energy that's greater than the hardwired programs in uh -huh. your brain and the emotional conditioning in your body. And your body literally has to respond to your mind. That the choice that you're making to change <laughs> in that moment becomes a moment in time that you never forget. And here's the key. Physically. Physically. The stronger the emotion you feel when you make that choice, the more you'll remember the decision. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then how do we downregulate that old belief? If the trauma created an emotional quotient of six or seven, then your decision to change your beliefs got to be a nine. Right. And you got to come out of your resting state and that moment has to define you. You could say, I know exactly where I was, the time and day it was, who I was with when I made my mind up to change, mm -hmm. right? Because you created a long-term memory. Long-term memories are created with from strong emotion, emotion. Yes. right? But if the amplitude of that emotion is greater than the betrayal, Boom, the body starts responding to the mind and you're actually giving your body a taste of the future emotionally. So you brand your- What's you, possible? No, your body's actually getting the taste of that future event. It's experiencing the future now. Now, exactly. Big yeah. explosion in the quantum field, wow. big explosion. So the side effect of that is if you combine that clear intention with that elevated emotion, you're basically remembering your future and it looks no different than remembering your past. Think neurologically within the circuits of that memory and feel within the emotions of that new belief and watch your life begin to change because nothing changes in our life that we change. And when we change our energy, we change our life. So now the experiment all of a sudden is no longer based on it being hard or trying or wishing or wanting mm -hmm. or hoping. That's what we do when we're lack or in lack or separation. It's about change. So then when we finally realize in order for us to become abundant, we have to overcome the old personality. And that's 95% of who we are, right? Yes. So then the side effect of the beginning of this process is a lot of discomfort. <laughs> <laughs> it is a lot of discomfort because you're stepping outside the known into the unknown and now you can't predict. It's scary. No, no, it's you'd, ra you'd so. rather hold on to your lack. The pain, the suffering. Rather tell the story of that. At least it makes you feel something that's familiar. Mm -hmm. When you step outside and you're saying, I'm not gonna complain about money any longer. I'm not gonna complain about I don't have any. I'm not gonna judge other people who do. I'm not gonna say I can, I'm not worthy. It's never gonna work. All those things gotta go. 
I'm not going to feel lack. I'm not going to feel unworthy. I'm not going to feel separation. I'm not going to feel resentment. These are the things that are keeping my reality the same. Now it's no longer about abundance, about who you become. Mm -hmm. So the overcoming process becomes the becoming process. And so many people come through this work. They want abundance. They want healing. They want a new relationship. They want a new career. They want the mystical. But really, they want wholeness. And, and they want healing. They want peace. They want, they want wholeness. Because they feel on whole. Well, well, when you're in lack or you're in separation, you're not whole. Mm. Imagine feeling so much wholeness that's impossible to want. That's what, our, that's what we're working on with people. Then you can really enjoy a sunset. Then you can really enjoy a meal. Mm. Then you can really enjoy your friends. Then you can... I, 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 I talk to people that are very abundant. I mean, in the billions abundant. And, you know, so many of them say, we are in misery. Because we're not whole. We're in agony because they can't enjoy life anymore. That's what they want. I mean... People want abundance to be able to enjoy life. They want to be able to do whatever they want with whoever they want as many times as they want wherever they want. That's freedom, right? Or people want abundance. The sponsoring thought is really they want freedom, right? Or whatever their sponsoring thought would be, right? So, so then creating from the field instead of from matter to shorten the distance between cause and effect requires that clear intention with that elevated emotion, coherent brain and coherent heart. Tune into that energy and feel it with your brain and your heart. I mean, we have plenty of ways to do that. Examine your personality and examine your personal reality. Change your personality, change your personal reality. Don't make it be about abundance. Mm -hmm. Make it about becoming abundant by overcoming the person who's not abundant. The person who heals themselves from a health condition, who's no longer thinking the same way, no longer acting the same way, no longer feeling the same way. You ask them where that disease is when they stand on the stage in front of 1,500 people or 3,000 people, and that's a four-minute mile. Everybody's leaning in. That's truth right on the stage. They say, where is that? Where is the disease? Oh, it lives in the old person. Wow. I'm, I'm somebody else. That, yeah. that, that's like, that's, I don't even, that's not even a story. That's not even who I am any longer. So. Lo and behold, when we do our research, and people do this, in seven days of going all in, at the end of seven days, their body looks like, genetically, with all the metabolites, that they're literally in a different environment. You know, here's the weird part. Mm. They're in a ballroom. Right. There's not a lot <laughs> happening in a ballroom. Right, right. What's happening in a ballroom? I've been to thousands of ballrooms. Yeah. But the environment somehow looks like they're living in a very prosperous, very healthy, very loving, nurturing, very whole environment. Why? Because they were signaling genes ahead of the environment. Mm -hmm. And if the environment signals the gene, okay, that's epigenetics. The end product of the experience in the environment is an emotion. If you feel the emotion before the experience, you're signaling the gene ahead of the environment. What are the main limiting beliefs that you just hear consistently that most people tend to have if they're not in a heavy, uh, uh, higher level program that they've caught and switched with? Well, one of the main beliefs that they're caught up in is the uh, lack of power they feel over their own health and their own reality. That I'm a victim. I'm a victim of my genes. I'm a victim of this world out here. I say if you if a, <laughs> the belief system uh, is translated into behavior, <laughs> If I believe I'm a victim, then my behavior will be as a victim. No power. You guys tell me what to do, and I'll try and do what you just said. And I say, well, that's the biggest problem of all, because quantum physics, I mentioned, is the most valid science. And principle number one is you're the creator of this. And it's like, well, when are you going to own that? And the answer is, I could say it, but then you walk away, and a few minutes later, you're back into your world again. And everything is gone. You know, listen, it took me a while. Uh, I learned and understood that, oh, my God, this is how it works. And I was so excited. I wanted to get people, I wanted to tell anybody, to listen to the science. <laughs> this is how it works. So I, I beginning got some people together, and I started to go off. Let me tell you how to create the most beautiful life experience. And then they'd look at me, and they go, you know, Lipton, for a guy who says you know this, your, your life doesn't look that good. Interesting. It was my wake-up call that said, how the hell can I talk about how wonderful this is and I'm not practicing it? And I immediately said to myself, no, don't go out there and talk to anybody about this. Why? Until you do it. So what were the, what were the things that were holding you back 
before you discovered this? And then what was the new program that you started to implement for yourself on a consistent basis to have a 100% upgraded program? Yeah. Well, uh, one of the things professionally, okay, I was doing a great job. I, I had a great professorship in a medical school, all that kind of stuff. For, you know, personally, my life sucked. <laughs> really? I get a relationship off the ground. I go, why not? And I go, well, now that I know about it, I was programmed about relationships by observing my father and my mother. Well, they had dysfunctional relationships. So what do you think I downloaded? Dysfunction. Yeah. So my conscious mind goes forward and says, yeah, I want to have a great relationship. I get into it. My subconscious mind steps up and says, oh, this is how we do a relationship. You, Ooh, uh-oh, <laughs> game over. Right. You know, why? Because I didn't see the negative behaviors that I was putting out my partner, potential partner saw them and gave them cause for alarm. I don't think I want to be with this guy. You know, that was me. <laughs> uh, and then I realized that. And that's when I really had to go in first thing and start to change. Who am I? And I'll tell you the biggest problem uh, now after years of working, people do not love themselves. Mm. And I say, what does that mean? I said, if you have a program where you don't love yourself, then rationally logically can anybody else love you and the answer no. is no because you don't think you're lovable that's right and somebody says you are that oh i love you and then you go well you know you probably don't have any quality control i know i'm not lovable what's wrong with you you know <laughs> and then at some point you push them away and then they're not there and then you go i'm not lovable nobody's here <laughs> i i push them away you know and I changed that. I was nearly, what, 45 years old, 40 some years mm. old. And I had zero quality relationships for all that life. Right. I changed the program. And within a couple of years, I, I'm now with my partner, Margaret. Uh, and, and the fact is, she was involved with a um, workshop training program for people. So she understood processing and stuff. And when I came and we added the science and the processing, uh, we've been living a honeymoon for 26 mm. years, 26 really years, waking up every day going, wow, still here. Another day for fun. Another day for being in love. It was great. And it still is. But if I didn't change the program, that would never have been part of my life at all. I would have been my whole life struggling. How did you change it? And what was the thing that you started to say in replace of the previous program? Well, the first thing was I had, we do muscle testing. Now you're an athlete, all that stuff. And you know about muscles. Well, let me just say about muscle testing. The conscious mind is a creative mind, but, and the subconscious mind is a program, but the subconscious mind being a massive processor controls muscles, the subconscious, not thinking, man, it's boom. It's just programmed real fast reflexes. Boom. Like this. Okay. So <clears throat> if you make a statement, with your conscious mind, the creative mind. And the subconscious mind doesn't agree with that. There's no history to support that statement. Then the two minds are not in harmony. I say, what happens when they're in disharmony? And the answer is it weakens the subconscious mind. Wow. And your muscles get weaker. So, so how, do we, how do we get them in harmony? Well, you have to make sure then whatever statements you're making are agree with the subconscious program. And if you want a statement that's positive and your subconscious program doesn't have it, then all of a sudden you say, well, that's where I got, I got to fix a subconscious mind. I don't need to fix a conscious one. And that's when it comes back. Well, then programming that subconscious mind. Uh, another one that was so amazing was uh, I tried to write my biology belief book. I got to three different times. I got started, got about halfway through and it just petered out. I just, mm. just disappeared. And I, and I was so upset because I really wanted to write this book. And then doing muscle testing, uh, I found out that my subconscious mind did not support writing the book. I go, why not? And the answer was because I'm a scientist. And if I wrote the book, which had spirituality in it, I would lose my support from my colleagues. So my subconscious mind was saying, okay, that's enough. That, no more writing, because if you conclude this, you're going to be an outcast from your society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I remember uh, doing a, one of these balances, they're called 15 minutes or less. And in the process, uh, uh, part of the balance was, how do I want this book to be written now? Well, I said, I want it to be written fast because I wasted a lot of time. <laughs> and I thought struggling over it was a pain. In the ass. So uh, 
I thought, you know, um, maybe it should be fun, <laughs> okay? And uh, uh, and so for fun and easy, uh, uh, whatever it was, I balanced that. And I forgot about it because it was just 15 minutes and it was like, oh yeah, I should do something about that, blah, blah, blah. And months later, the book is done. Wow. And I remember uh, getting reviewing it. It's going to go to the publisher. This is the final read, sending it to the publisher. Get down to the last page, down to the last thing. Get down to the last line. I, it's finished. And I pushed myself back in the chair. And I said, wow, that was fast and kind of fun. And it was easy. I said, holy those are the words that I put in, which I completely forgot about. And I programmed my mind that way. And the moment I finished the book, I said, fast, fun, and easy. I go, holy, that's what, that was the program. Mm. Uh, uh, and it was what took me off. And, uh, and but go back to the, I love myself one, because uh, I can tell you now for a fact, uh, and being involved with so many belief change programs, um, over 80%, generally 90% of every audience will not test positive for I love myself. Uh, that's a very large number. <laughs> and that means why, why so many marriages fall apart, because mm. they never really connected. They were sort of like, uh, you know, on the surface, really nice, but their subconscious programs clash, boom, gone, right. it's not working. Uh, and, and then the idea is what? Well, let me give you a reason why. You're an athlete, so I know I can tell you right, right where the, that programming worked. And it goes like this. Um, if a kid on a sports team is not doing well, the coach doesn't go, oh, please try harder. You could do better. I go, no, coach comes out there. That's not good enough. Who do you think you are? You know, you're not worthy to be on this team, blah, blah, blah. And the player immediately in the conscious mind goes, oh, my God, I, I better work harder and be better. And great. Now I say, what if the parent is acting as a coach and the kid is five years old? I go, why is that important? I said, they're not using the conscious mind at five years old. They're in record. And the parent said, that's not good enough. You don't deserve this. You're not lovable. Who do you think you are? I say, the child is not thinking about what the parent was intending. The right. child is recording. I'm not lovable. I'm not deserving. I'm not. This. And I go, the 95% of your life is going to come from that program. And you see why you struggle. You don't love yourself because the first thing you'd be critical of yourself. I'm not good enough. I'm not this. I, I go, well, now you're self-critical. <laughs> and the moment you're self-critical, you just uh, cancel the whole game right at that point. So what is this muscle balance test thing you were talking about? Is this called muscle you, testing? How do you do this? Well, uh, one a very simple way. You can use any part of your body with muscles. I could push on your head. I could push on a finger. Usually it's done with an arm. My arm. Yeah, push my arm, arm down. And yeah. the game is this. It's not arm wrestling. People think, oh, I say, no, no. The idea is this. You have to keep focus. You, you make a statement and you keep your mind on that statement. Uh, difference give me, give me an example. Give me an example of like, uh, I love, I love myself. myself. I love myself. Okay. Hold out yeah. your arm. Point. If the conscious and subconscious agree the muscle is a rock, you could do chin ups on that arm. Okay. But if the subconscious doesn't agree with the conscious mind, you say I'm lovable and the subconscious mind will give you all the reasons why you're not. Mm. And guess what? Now the two minds are in disharmony and now the, the arm will move. I say, well, how much does it move? I say, well, all you need to know is that it moved that much. <laughs> if it just moved that a little much, bit. any yeah. more pushing or thing, now that's arm wrestling. It was, if, if they both agree, that's solid. That's not even going to move. But if there's, if the two don't agree, then just even the first downward movement like that says, that's it, that you don't have to do any more. Let's say you make a million dollars in your business, but then you invested a lot in the stock market or whatever, and then half of it goes away overnight. Who doesn't have that happen? Right. Every abundant person has that happen. Right. And, and, and their response is minimal. So what should be people be thinking when they lose a lot of money or they lesson, lose something? Don't lose the lesson. Uh, you may lose the money, but don't lose the lesson. Should people feel this emotional attachment to the money no, loss? No, why? Or just why? Say, what, okay. is, what is money? I mean, what is that? What people really want. It's like people say to me, oh, I have this great idea for this new business and, and I need money. And I say, you don't need money. 
you need opportunity. Mm -hmm. You need opportunity. You better tune in to some opportunities, right? So it's the framing of how limited we think that we have to get things through money. It just is not the way it is. Yeah. So the fundamental importance about all of this is I, I really don't care if people want to be abundant. I don't care if they want to heal. I don't care if they want to have a mystical. I don't care what, when I travel the world. It doesn't matter to me. I just want them to be in the experiment. The experiment of actually trying it out yes. and seeing, God, if I really change my energy, well, could I actually have an effect that's produced in my life? And if I'm waiting for the event to occur, I'm back to the illusion of separation and lack, mm -hmm. waiting for it to happen, to take it away if I'm truly a creator. So let's say, let's say they're not waiting. What should they do instead of waiting? Keep feeling the feeling in the present moment and trust Look, right. if, you're, will, if you're waiting, you're not creating. I mean, that's just the mm. way it is. So wake up every day. How bad do you want it? How bad do you want your dream? It's so much easier to forget that vision than to remember it, right? So yes. if you're going to remember it, you got to keep it alive in your mind. How do you keep it alive in your mind? You, you disconnect from your environment. You close your eyes. You play music in the background. You get, sit your body down and it's got to pee and it's got to eat and it's got to, well, you just, <laughs> just sit down for a few minutes, yes. like training a dog, like yeah. stay. When I say it's time to get up, we get up. Don't be thinking about what's going to happen in your day. You already know what's going to happen. Don't think what happened yesterday. You already know that. Get in the present moment and say, who do I want to be when I open my eyes? Who do I want to be today? What would mm -hmm. greatness look like? Huh? Right. How, how would I, how would, well, one day, one shot, one lifetime, what would an abundant person do? Let me rehearse that. With my eyes closed, let me remind myself who I don't want to be. Let me remind myself of who do I want to be. Let's not get up, Lewis. Until we get into that. Until yeah. we are to where the tennis ball hits the sweet spot. When you go, oh, I'm ready for the day now. Now, game on. Now, if you can maintain that modified state of mind and body the entire day without defaulting by seeing someone or doing something, stay in that state, the experiment still continues. And you're changing your energy. Doesn't happen in two days. You're not that good. Right. That's it. You're not that good. We keep practicing. Keep, yeah. People who show up the, for the 21 weeks in a row, this woman, 21 weeks in a row, the end of 21 weeks, she knew it. Boom. Her whole life changed. Boom. Was it 21 days worth it? Ask her. The experiment, she was just changing the process. People who diagnose with really serious health conditions... And they start doing the meditations and they realize, wow, God, my body feels better, my pain feels better, but my values, my scans are still showing the disease exists. All right, did it, does it mean that it doesn't work? No, it doesn't mean it doesn't work. It means like, what am I doing the other 15 hours of the day? Mm -hmm. Oh my God, I'm in lack, I'm in fear, I'm responding to the same people in the same uh -huh. ways. And you got to think about this. As long as your response to everything in your life is the same, you're not changing. Right. So change your response to things in your life and you're in the process of change. So then now I got to get good with my eyes open. Now I got to be able to rehearse. Oh my God, I fell from grace at that moment in my day. Oh my God, I defaulted back mm -hmm. to the old self. Forgive went back. yourself, yeah. All right, no, so it's not it's only forgive yourself. Like there's a forgiving process like shoot. But if you're truly playing the game, who cares, right? Mm -hmm. You just go, oh God, let me brush myself off. Get back to get back, it. Let me, yeah. let me get back in my heart here. Let me get back in that place. Let me remember, let me get back in this energy. And let's try it again. Let's try it again. Yes. And, and let's just keep the experiment going. Now, does that mean you have to be irresponsible? No, you still have to navigate with ethics and morality. You still have to have personal conviction. You still have to have a vision that's bigger than you and somehow that motivates you because not only you're doing it for selfish reasons, but to contribute to others in some way. Of course, there's going to be recognition and popularity and aggrandizement that goes with it. Money should be the side effect mm -hmm. of all that. The game should be so good of your vision, like that vision of the future, you have to keep alive in your mind. That should be the game. The you ones mean, that can keep that vision of the future in their mind now. Exactly. And, and have yeah. a personality. Even if, you're, even if your reality is falling apart, <laughs> and that's happened to a lot of people. I mean, there are people that come through our work that are living in the back of their car. Right. And now they're, you know, th living very well or, or th sure. bankrupt. And now they're, you know, their companies are thriving, just thriving. Yeah. They just... They just never stopped believing in themselves. Because if you believe in yourself, it means you have to believe in possibility. And if you believe in possibility, you're going to have to believe in yourself. And so 
something really cool happens when you do this that I just discovered recently. Just watching people at our week-long events, um, you know, because you got to go all in. You got to go all in. And it's seven days and it's a lot and it's super intense. And there's times where you don't want to show up because I'm pushing mm. people across the river of change. There comes a moment where people keep showing up for themselves. They keep showing up for themselves in spite of the weather, in spite of their foot hurting, in spite of their bad dream, in spite of the whatever, their fight with or whoever. They keep showing up. They get really worthy to receive. They, it's no, they feel really worthy, like, I am worthy to receive this gift. And the universe only gives us what we think we're worthy of receiving, right? So we got to get to that point because so many people who are in lack somehow don't feel worthy, right? Mm -hmm. so, so the abundance then becomes the sign that you finally become worthy. And in the, for the soul, it's not about the abundance. It's about mastering your worthiness. Mm. And the reflection Man. is the things that you accumulate. What's, the, what's the, the strategy to start believing we're worthy of receiving now? Is there Fill a your brain with as much knowledge as possible. And, and listen, my dad used to say this to me all the time. He'd say, wait, 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 wait a second. Wait a second. Just sit down with me here. If anybody else can do it, you could do it also. Mm. Well, let's just start there. So how did these people do it? Like, let's look at what they did. Right. All right, let's study. We are, this is a school of greatness. Yeah. Let's study greatness. What, what is greatness? Like an uncompromising will, invincibility, right. lead with their heart, adapt and make changes, let go of the past, give, you, give, give life, live it fully and completely and embrace it and enjoy it. I don't know, whatever, you get to write the script. Yeah. And you, you tell the story of your future instead of telling the story of your past. Watch mm, what my happens. Gosh. What is, so how do we, should we be speaking to others about our future or should we be more keeping that to our mind and our bodies and kind of speaking it to ourselves? What happens when you say, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do this yeah, and this yeah. is my future, does that's that a, actually that's hurt a great us? Question. Yeah, so I really don't leak it out. Yeah, I never yeah. leak it out. Because so if I'm working on you. something, yeah. I hold it, right? I don't wanna, I don't, I, I'll, when, it, when I know it's going to happen, that's when I'll say, hey, you guys, this is, <laughs> you're not gonna believe this, right? So it's more to yourself. Right, listen, you future. know when you know when you're changing? When you stop talking about it. That's when you know you're changing. Because you're out you're of the bleachers and you're on the playing field. Look, look so many people come to our work, Lewis, and they say, I, I always believed that this was possible. All this information it seems, I've seen people heal them, some people create well. Uh, I, I get it, I just didn't believe it would work for me. Mm. Oh, it's a big moment, it's a, it's a big moment. Now, now you are on the game, you're in, I'm mean, in the playing field. You're, yes. you're out of the bleachers. Like, like, we had people stand on the stage. Someone stand on the stage this weekend in Denver. Just said, "My God, I, 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 I really believe that that um, this would work. I just, I just didn't believe I could heal. I didn't believe. I really didn't believe it. I really didn't believe. She was a physician. Is a physician. I really didn't believe I could heal. Now, is it about the healing anymore?" It's about overcoming the belief. And every day, she's got to make that decision with such firm intention that the amplitude of that decision is causing her body to respond to her mind. And that's the moment she's rewriting the belief. And if, if she doesn't feel like it, don't expect anything to occur in your life. You got to come out of your resting state. You got to, you got to make that choice. What do you, for the, all the people that go to your events, uh, and just in life, one of the biggest challenges people have is the consistency of doing these things. Yes. It's hard to actually go and try it once. No, That's but, but here's thing. the deal. How here's do you the stay deal. accountable? Here's the deal. Here's the deal. Yeah. Let's just say you're in the experiment. Uh -huh. And now that belief is right in your face. I guarantee you that discomfort from that belief being right in your face is going to get you out of bed in the morning mm -hmm. and you're going to face off with it. There's an, there's an innate capacity that we have as human beings to want to overcome our limitations. It's in there, right? So the community that, that we have that does this work, they're not like, oh God, I gotta go create today. <laughs> That's not their game. The magic is so good. They show up because they don't want the magic to end. To go away, yeah. They don't, they, they're not doing it as a have to, to please God, do the right thing, be spiritual. None of that. None, it's not an obligation. 
It's something that they actually look forward to doing because the experiment in their life is creating all these wonderful opportunities. And, and there's plenty of people in our work that started new businesses that are sure. jam they're jamming. Yeah, yeah. They're jamming. They're jamming. And, and, and they would never be victim. What's the percentage of people that you think live in victimhood? In I'd have to say 90% or more. Really? At every level, I'm a victim of what? Well, my job. If I don't do what they said, then uh, I lose my job. I don't have a job. I don't have any money. I don't have any health care. I don't have any money. And all of a sudden, you start to realize, well, then where do I get the money? And then you better, well, you better start conforming to whoever's going to give you the money. Yeah, at some point, uh, you're not living your life. You're living the program that you think you need to do to fit into the picture. Mm. And, and if you live the program, it's almost all disempowerment. I can't do this. Right. This won't happen. I can't, you know, whatever. I'm a victim. And, sure. and, and victims, by just saying that, the word is powerless. Victim and powerless, same word. Right. And, and what do you think the differences are then between the, the conscious and the subconscious mind? And I know well, you've mentioned that's, that. That's the game. That's the most important whole question you just asked there right now, Lewis, for this reason. The subconscious, I said, is the equivalent of a hard drive on a computer. It can run the show. You push start, it could do things. You don't have to even attend to it. It does it by itself. The conscious mind is the equivalent of who's typing on the keyboard because you're the one that's putting information into this thing. The mm -hmm. conscious mind, uh, and here's the important part. Let's just start with this. The mind is controlling our biology. That's a fact. Now I go, but when you say the mind, it sounds like, oh, there's one mind. I go, now that is where it goes wrong because there are two minds and they, they both have different functions. And most importantly, they learn in different ways. What are the two minds? Well, let's start with the latest evolution. Right behind your forehead is a lump of brain called prefrontal cortex, the seat of self-consciousness. I am uh -huh. an individual. I am separate from all other individuals. I am a self, and I'm a, you know coming from this creative part. Uh, the subconscious mind, as we mentioned, that's just the hard drive with programs in it. So I say, so what's the difference between it? Well, the first thing is this. What makes humans so different than other organisms is the self-conscious or conscious mind because it's creative. It has imagination. I could ask you right now, Lewis, I could tell you, I could ask you a question. I say, tell me what you want out of your life. Well, at that moment, you're going to think and you're going to say, you know, I want this and I, I want that. And I go, well, that came from the conscious mind. Now it's creative. That has imagination. That has vision. And if you have a, a vision, you can then manifest a vision. If you, mm. you can't manifest a vision if you don't have a vision. <laughs> so conscious mind sets up visions and what we want. But here's the point. Um, and th this is the, the critical, the whole thing is on this one part right now, Lewis, right here, and that is this. The conscious mind, which is the creative mind versus subconscious mind, which is the habit mind. It does habits as does its program. Program's a habit. Push the button, play the program, push the button, play it again, push it, play it again. Okay, program. Conscious mind creator. Okay. And I go, okay, significance of that is that's where your wishes and desires are. What do you want? Oh, man, I want this. I want a great relationship. I want a great job. I want great health. You know, you're creative. The subconscious mind programs primarily derived from other people before age seven. Okay. And unfiltered. So there are good programs and there are bad programs. Okay. Uh, and I go, so creative conscious mind is the one that gives you a destination in a future. Subconscious mm -hmm. mind just gives you autopilot. Okay, back to the crux of the problem. Only 5% of the day is the conscious mind actually engaged in creating. And I go, well, then what's it doing 95? I get 95% <laughs> of the day, it's thinking. I go, so what does that mean? I go, imagine your body's a vehicle, steering wheel, conscious is holding a wheel and driving us to where? Wishes and desires, man. Okay? And I say, but if I start thinking, then conscious mind's no longer looking out because thinking is inside. It's a mm -hmm. thought on the inside. I said, well, if you're thinking, then conscious mind is not looking out. I go, well, what if you're driving the car and then you start thinking? I go, conscious mind let go of the wheel. I said, oh my God. I go, no, don't worry, why? Subconscious mind is autopilot. Whatever you're not controlling with your conscious mind, subconscious mind throws a program in and does it, okay? Mm.
Now, the issue about that is, well, if the conscious mind is thinking, is it observing what's going on? I go, no, to observe what's going on, it has to look out the window, it can't be looking inside. So 95% of the day, it doesn't even observe your own behavior. I said, but where's that behavior coming from? I go, the program. I go, but yeah, but where did that come from? I go, somebody else. And I go, what's relevant? Well, if they didn't put your wishes and desires into their life, then you copy their program. You're you're not going toward your wishes and desires. You're going to wherever the hell their program is going to. That's how children follow in the footpath of their parents, mm. especially like musicians. A, a musician who is a parent uh, during the programming of their own child instills them with all the music and stuff like that. Then a child grows up and guess what? Now they're a musician. People say, the music gene. I go, there's no music gene. There was training <laughs> for seven years, training to be that. So. The issue is 95% of our life is not coming from wishes and desires. It's coming from programs, which came from other people. And you don't see it when it's happening. And I go, why not? And I say, why are you playing a program? Because I'm not paying attention. I go, well, that's yeah. why you don't see the program. And I go, and then 95% of your life is program. And then the relevance about that is, 60% of those are, are <laughs> disempowering or self-sabotaging or limiting beliefs. So it says, then 95% of the day you're running your life and you're the only one that doesn't see it. I go, well, that's the big issue. I go, the same story for 40 years that's been in all my videos, but I got to do it again because different audience here. Yeah. You have a friend, you know your friend's behavior very, very well. You're really, you know, good friends. And you happen to know your friend's parent. And one day you see your friend has the same behavior as their parents. So, you know, you got to tell, you got to tell, hey, Bill, you're just like your dad. Back away from Bill. I know exactly what Bill's going to say all the time. Bill's going to say, how can you compare me to my dad? I'm nothing like my dad. The audience laughs. Why? They're familiar with it. I go, that, you want the profound story of the day? That's the profound story. I go, what does it mean? Everybody else can see that Bill behaves like his dad. The only one who can't see it is Bill. Explain it simple. Yeah. Bill downloaded these programs from his dad. Yep. When does he play them? When he's thinking. And I say, and how much of that? I say, 95% of the day. I say, does he see the program? I say, no, thinking is inside. He's not looking out. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so Bill's the only one that doesn't see it and he got it from somebody else. And so it's not his behavior and he could be sabotaging himself. And he's the only one that can't see it because why? Because he's thinking. And I go, okay, you ready? All of us are Bill. Right. All of <laughs> us every day are Bill. We're playing the same programs. We look at life going, oh man, that's not what I wanted. I would, oh, this is not really good. And I go, where's this coming from? Well, those people are causing, this people are causing. I go, no, you're the creator. Mm. Didn't see what you were creating with. And when we get personal awareness of this, then personal empowerment is the next step. Because now it's like, well, if I'm doing this, then I'm the one that can change it. I go, absolutely. Absolutely. That's what the whole point is. Uh, and this is why you're, you know, all your programs, Lewis, are so involved with wake up, people. It's time to take the power back and become what you want to be in this life because you don't realize you're playing programs that are sabotaging you all day long and you yes. don't see it. You're the only one. And right. so that's the, the big wake up call. So it says, well, what can I do? And I say, well, A, you could just not play the program. And I go, that's not easy to do. That means you can't think. <laughs> right. And thinking is so fundamental, everything. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's very difficult to say, I will stay mindful. That means I will not think. I will stay here in the present mind and pay attention to what's going on. I go, mm -hmm. great, but it's very difficult to do that. So I say, well, if you're not going to stay mindful, then what else can I do? I said, well, then change the program. And if you change the program, then 95% of the day, if you put a program that's your wishes and your desires, mm -hmm. then 95% of the day, you will be manifesting that when the program is running, wow. and plus an additional 5% when your conscious mind is running it. So that would be 100% of the day you would be moving toward wishes and desires. But you have to look at the program. That's why we announced, I say, what's the program? Look at your life. What do you want to change? What's not working for you? The creative moment is when you get beyond yourself, mm -hmm. when you dissociate from everything known in your material world. Turns out when you do that and you start changing your brainwaves, 
your brain waves slow down into alpha and theta, you're suppressing the memory bank of the known self that keeps you plugged into three-dimensional reality. Mm. When you quiet down this mechanism, now all of a sudden you start connecting to that field. And when you can stay conscious in those subconscious realms, when you can literally regulate and change brain waves, now you're in the operating system where you can make those significant changes. So we now know that when people apply the formula and they do that properly, now they're walking through that door where they're ready to create from. In other words, you can't create from the known. Mm -hmm. You can't create with your body. That's matter trying to change matter. And you can do it, it's just gonna take a long time. Right. But when you create from the field instead of from matter, there's a whole different set of dynamics that takes place. And, and why not push that envelope to see, okay, if we've done this, we've done this, is it possible to do this? As an example, we do these wonderful healing circles where you see these dramatic instantaneous changes. So the person who's healed themselves of some health condition, when it comes time to heal somebody else, that's, they're gonna say, well, now I understand the science, I understand how this all works, I know how to get beyond myself, I know how to open my heart, they start piecing it all together, let's take the formula to the next level. Now they witness a significant change in a person's body in real time, right there. So then the next question is, okay, like this happened many times. As an example, the woman who was at the event in Mallorca, Spain, uh, her brother had a massive stroke uh, in, uh, in Colombia, and she went back to Colombia, and he was in a coma for two weeks. Mm. She called up the healing circle and said, hey, can we do a healing on my brother? Now, if you're playing by the rules of Newtonian physics, three-dimensional reality, you're gonna say, well, you need to be in front of the, the guy in order to heal him. But if you understand that there's no separation in the quantum, that there's, everything's connected when right. you're in that place. So wouldn't that be the next application of the formula? So they go over the science, they get it. Okay, we don't need, we just need a picture of him and that's our coordinate. And if we're in the field- Sending a frequency to that coordinate. Yeah, yeah. But, but you're not sending it anywhere because there's nowhere to send. There's mm. no space and time it's there. You're connecting to you're it. You're connecting to it, exactly. That's a great, great way to say it. In one hour after that coherence healing, he comes back to consciousness. Wow. Now, that's the extension of where we're going. You see, now, now, now we're progressing. A woman who was in one, uh, who, uh, one coherence healing group is a pediatric nurse in, uh, in Children's Hospital in Seattle. And again, witnessed the amazing miracle after our event in Toronto. Mm. She comes back and there's a little, they call them friends, there's a little guy failing. Doctors hit him with the paddles, they use all the, all the drugs to bring him back, and they walk out of the room, and they say, we, we lost him. She walks over, puts her hands right in the field, and this kid comes right back online. Wow. Doctors are like, what was that? And now, so we have, the, a lot of our interest now is, I wanna get 50%. One out of two people, we're collecting the data in this coherence healings. When we're 50%, we're gonna walk into a children's hospital. We have three children's hospitals right now that are interested in us. We'll show them the data. Mm. We'll show them the results. We'll say, we don't want any money. We'll never even touch the kids. All we wanna do is just change their lives. And when we're 50%, we're gonna start doing it in children's hospitals. And, and we're gathering the data right now. That's pretty cool. Yeah, well, what, else would we, what else would we wanna do with it, yeah, right? exactly, it's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Do you have kids? I do. You have I kid. do. How old are your kids? My kids are uh, in their 20s, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, they're all older and on their way. What do they think about this work? Well, my oldest son, uh, well, first of all, my kids have grown up with this work. Yeah. So you have to imagine like uh, my oldest son coming back to one of my advanced workshops three years ago and my friends saying, hey, is this your first advanced workshop? And he kind of glances over at him and says, I've been in the advanced workshop for 25 <laughs> yeah, years. Yeah. What are you talking about? So my oldest son is one of my team leaders. Uh, mm. He's got a master's in engineering. He lives in, in Denver, uh, in Boulder, Colorado. And uh, uh, he's, uh, he's, he's passionate about the work. Uh, he met his fiance at my, one of my workshops. Uh, cool. And they're very, very similar. Uh, my daughter lives in London. Uh, and she's got her master's in art at the Royal College of Art. And wow. she's probably the best creator I have ever met in my life. Mm. I mean, she's just wired. She knows how to do it. And my, my youngest son is uh, goes uh, is getting his degree in architecture uh, at Cal Poly, and they're all at different stations uh, in their understanding, but they understand the principles. And mm -hmm. and I've always said to them, you know, if you can figure this out 
early on, the rest of your life is going to be magic, right? Because yeah. you know what to do. And, and they're pretty wired for it now. And, and I've really worked in setting up conditions uh, in their lives uh, so that they can apply uh, these principles from an early age. And now that they're older, um, I think that uh, they understand uh, how to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like a lot of people are unhappy in relationships. Yeah. Here's and my theory. They're like, a lot of them are failing. I don't want to put that as a general thing because there's a lot of happy relationships as well. Mm -hmm. But for people that are mission driven, um, how much more challenging is it to have a thriving relationship when you put your life into a mission? No, oh, here's, the, here's the deal. Um, I will never work in a relationship. I just won't. If I'm working in a relationship, something's wrong. I'll work on me. I'll bring my best, you bring your best, and we get together, and we celebrate and it that. should work. It should work, and if it doesn't, then I'm gonna step back and see what is it about me, not you, what is it mm. about me that mm. I need to really look at and change. Now, uh, if there's a vibrational match, and it flows, and it's fun, and you connect on um, um, physically, mentally, mind, body, soul, you know, that's cool, I, I think that's healthy. Uh, uh, but a mission-driven person can't be in a relationship where you have to keep going back and, and, and trying to fix something. I just, I just won't do that. I just think that when, it, when it's right, it's right. And I'll know. Yeah. Yeah. So I, think that, I do think that uh, relationships uh, can be easy. And I, I do think, I, uh, and I think that they should be. And I, and I think that if you're heart-centered, uh, that's a different place you meet yeah. uh, than than uh, other emotions, and and and, I, and, I, and again, every time I have a mystical moment, and I feel that transcendental love that I don't even know the word for. Uh, every time I have one of those moments, I think I got this all wrong. It's just that it it's it is not chemical; it's electric. And, and you got what all wrong. Well, the way we view the world, uh -huh. the way we, I mean, we don't see things how they are, we see things how we are, mm -hmm. you know, and every inner experience that's transcendental experience enriches circuitry in your brain. Experience produces emotion or energy in the body. So you start having transcendental moments where you start connecting to that field. Its signature is love. I mean, but not love like a love for your puppy. It's, this <laughs> yeah, is yeah. like, this is like an arousal. Mm -hmm. This is I don't know the other word, but bliss. Spiritual arousal. A, yeah, and we have, the, we have the evidence. We can say, oh, watch this, watch this person's brain. And scientists are studying uh, our work. I'll say, oh, um, watch, she's going to pop in a few minutes. What do you mean, just watch, she's oh. going to pop. And all of a sudden, this person goes into an arousal. The sympathetic nervous system is so switched on, but the arousal isn't like an arousal that from the environment that produces anger, or aggression, or fear, or anxiety, or pain, or suffering. That's survival in the environment that produces the arousal. This arousal is coming from energy in the body that's moving up into the brain, and the arousal is bliss. Mm -hmm. The arousal is ecstasy. The arousal is freedom. Peace. Oof, yeah. But it's it's Love. it's not yeah. chemical. It's it's, you'll feel it in every single cell in your body. Now, here's the outcome of that. The outcome of that is that when you open your eyes and some conditioning, some layer has been removed, your spectrum of the way the world looks mm. broadens now because now you're wired to perceive what's always existed, but you didn't have the circuits in place to perceive them. So then it's the inner experience that literally trans, transforms our experience of the outer world. And so when you start having moments where you hit that kind of frequency or you have those moments of love, you're less dependent on anyone to bring you happiness. Yeah. You're, you're, you're okay, you can love the person for their flaws because you can see a part of yourself you used to be that you no longer are. And instead of judgment, you have compassion. Mm. And you can encourage and, and, and communicate from a, from a level of connection instead of intimidation or, or competition or however relationships work. So, so um, I, do th I, I, do, I do think that um, it's energy and vibration. And, and, and I think that uh, in our community, at least, people who have relationships that are built uh, from our community, uh, tend to be more long-lasting because they're more self-aware. Yeah. And so there's no blame, there's no excuses, there's no make wrong, there's no competition, there's none of that. There's just, this is who I am, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that the ultimate goal is 
when you reach the point in your life when how you appear to the world is who you really are, that level of transparency mm. is, it takes no effort. Right. You can be yourself and, and, and you know, people say to me, wow, you're, you're pretty approachable. And I say, well, God, I work so hard every day on overcoming myself in the morning, <laughs> yeah, yeah, overcoming yeah. my ego. Yeah. Why would I want to build it up the next day? Because <laughs> I got to face that guy again yeah, tomorrow morning. So why not just keep, you know, you know, taking those edges and, and smoothing them down so that, so that you're, you're less unconscious to all of those yeah. programs that are, are built in relationships. What do you think is going to be your biggest challenge over the next decade? As we wow. Get, as we get into 2020, into 2030, what will be your biggest personal challenge in the next 10 years? Um, we are like a living organism. I mean, the company is just, our, our community is growing so large. I think our biggest challenge right now is finding venues and, and, and the logistics to be able to go to the next level of, of being able to do it on a larger scale without losing the efficacy, mm-hmm. but without... The intimacy, the, the connection. In, yeah, I mean, uh, we, and we, we've done really great, Lewis, as a, as a culture in, in to responding to the world's needs. And, and, and I mean, we, we hit challenges all the time, you know, mm-hmm. and, and I was just telling my staff in a, in a meeting, look, um, we just can't keep doing things the same way. You can't ever do that again. It's just... It's not a time that yeah. doing things the same way doesn't work. So you got to be able to grow, you got to be able to learn, mm-hmm. you got to be able to stay contemporary with all the new technology and everything else, and you got to keep yeah. bringing on a bigger team. I mean, I am nothing. I am yeah. nothing without my team. Honestly, I mean, my, between my staff and my team leaders and and our volunteers and the way we do things, um, it's a it's a it's a it's a living organism. Everybody everybody counts. And and for me, when I have a group of people where everybody leads. You know, you see those mm-hmm. school of fish mm-hmm. or the flock of birds all moving together. You study that phenomenon. You think that there's some leader that everybody's following. Turns out there is no leader. Everybody's mm-hmm. leading. It's a bottom-up phenomenon. So oh, wow. you, get a, you get a really greased uh, team that really is heart-centered, that really is, uh, has the intent for the greatest good. And it's not about them. It's about how they co-lead. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that, uh, that that helps me do one thing really well and that is to focus on the people in the audience instead of everything else. So uh, we've been growing, I think, for the last 15 years or more. And, um, and I think just be, our biggest challenge is to be able to handle that growth. I mean, yeah. we get, I was just talking to my team, they were, we get over seven, 8,000 emails a month, I mean. Mm. With people with a lot of health conditions, a lot of questions. Yeah, and support. And, and want help. support, and yeah. so we're building infrastructure uh, you know, we're building uh, online ways to get people engaged mm-hmm. and, and to be able to, for me, f- to provide resources for people. Uh, so we're, I think the biggest challenge would just, is if I could, you know, I'm going to stay healthy, but aside from staying healthy, is, is just being able to handle the, the growth. Yeah. How old are you now? 57, my body, 57. my body's 57. Your, body, your mind is what, like a 12-year-old <laughs> child? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's 112 at the same time. Who knows, time. Yeah. right? Uh, 57, man. I hope I look like that at 57. Um, what do you think the world humanities challenge will be over the next decade as we enter 2020? Um, back to the principle, Lewis, of just different paradigms beginning to collapse. You know, economically, politically, socially, environmentally, religiously, yes. education, journalism, the uh, you know, medicine. Um, they they have to uh, move into chaos, mm. and chaos is just unpredictable. Because not order. working. Yeah, exactly. But now here's the challenge for humanity. You have one of two ways to embrace the breakdown of those 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 paradigms. You can face them with anger and hostility and fear, and you are only contributing to more of it. Uh, we have to see that those breakdowns are essential for something greater to happen. Mm-hmm. Now, we can't wait for governments to take care of us. That's t- we can't wait for uh, medicine to, to give us a drug that's going to heal us mm-hmm. from a condition. The truth is, with a greater level of consciousness, the change in awareness because of information, 
the greatest challenge we have as those, as those paradigms break down is to no longer emotionally react in the same way and be victims. You can't say, this president, this person, this, this whatever, is actually making me feel this way and think this way. Basically, you're in the program that you're, something outside of you is controlling you, yeah. how you feel and how you think. So then to self-regulate then is to say, how I think and feel is going to change my outer environment. So then mm. we're all faced with great opportunities brilliantly disguised as impossible situations. And we are at that point, at that nexus point in our, our evolution as a species. So then you don't try to fix that. That's never going to work. What you do is you create something better. Mm -hmm. And then everybody just naturally just leaves that and goes here. Now, it used to be some people would just come here and the majority would stay here because they're clinging to what they've been programmed or believe in. But now, because of information, everybody's like, that's not going to work. I already know it's not going to work and I don't care what anybody says, this is working for me. So people are moving to new, to, new, um, uh, to new applications, to new paradigms because it's working for them. So as long as we don't emotionally react to the breakdown that's happening currently in the world, and chaos is just unpredictable order, you know, as, as, as things move towards disorder, the novelty that's being created is literally chaos mm -hmm. because the known and everything staying the same is order. But as you step out into that unknown, it's the, you're having the chaos is unpredictable order being expressed through novelty. And we have to be able to learn how to take that disorder and with the application of brain and heart coherence create more order. So you can't mm. just say, hey, I'm standing up for peace and, you know, and being, being miserable with your coworker. You, you, right. you, you don't get to talk about peace until there's, you, you're, the, you're the living prayer of peace. Mm -hmm. Not just, we know, we know crime rates go down and violence goes down when there's peace projects in communities where there's meditation on peace. But when those peace gathering projects end, you know, you see that crime and violence and everything returns back to the same level. So it's not enough to just think it. Mm. We gotta demonstrate it. So if I'm demonstrating peace, and you're demonstrating peace, somebody else, because of mere neurons, is gonna go, wow, that person's unpredictable. Wow, they're different. It's given me permission to do the same. So I think that ultimately moving into that state of being, you know, as, as human beings, and, and, and creating unity, mm -hmm. that, you know, you keep watching so many programs on television that talk you into prejudice, that talk you into separation, that talk you into fear, that talk you into violence, that talk you into war, deceit, uh, negativity, um, you're, you're not going to trust anybody. In fact, you're going to see difference between you and me or anybody because that's what separation does. But yeah. when you're heart-centered and you feel connected, you don't see the person any longer, mm. right? You see something transcendent them. You see an essence, right? Yeah. And I think if you do that really well, that kind of emergence of a, of a new consciousness uh, that's less dependent on, on all of those outer things is really difficult yeah. to control. And if you want to control a community, control their emotions mm -hmm. and control them in survival. Right. When you overcome your emotions, you can see the hidden meaning behind all things. And when everybody's looking this way, you may be looking that way because you understand, look, you've just overcome your fear. Yeah. You've just overcome your yeah. hostility and anger. You've overcome the program of whatever it is. I swear to you, you, you are going to be able to connect people and that that then is the hope of the future. That's why, I'm, mm. that's why I'm hopeful of the future because I think that all of this that's happening in a world right now where s more things are happening in a shorter amount of time. I mean, if you're alive in this world and you haven't been experiencing the quickening, I mean, I mean yeah. you know, I said to uh, someone the other day, the day where you end your day and feel complete because you finished all your work, you'll never have that. And, yeah. you know, there's always more emails and more things to check, <laughs> right? So the demand has, has, has pressed us into this crazy realm mm. of, of, uh, of, of um, multitasking. And I think that you start shifting, where you place your attention is where you place your energy. So if you're shifting your attention all over the board, your energy is scattered. Yeah. So then when you start disconnecting from everybody, your boss, your coworker, you know, the news, uh, your cell phone, your computer, and you start going this way, 
I think it's uh, into the present moment, then if where you place your attention is where you place your energy and you're truly in the present moment, you got a lot of energy to execute. You got yeah. a lot of energy to use and you want to be able to do that eyes open. The more well. scattered your energy, the less you have to focus on pushing one thing forward. That's why people's dreams forward. don't yeah. happen because too scattered. It, yeah. it, it, there's no look. Look, if you keep putting your attention on some future experience that you are imagining with your mind, your body's going to follow your mind right there because that's where your energy is. But if you're putting your attention on everything known in your life, the shower, the coffee maker, you know, right. the, the toilet, and your body's following your mind every day to the known. But we want your body to follow your mind to the unknown, right? Yeah. Enough people get to doing that, and you could do better in creating things in your life. That we see this wealthy people in our work that have focused on wealth. Some of them living in the back seat of their car. Some of them bankrupt that now have multi-million-dollar companies. What do you think they want to do with that money? They want to give it away. Yeah, give back. Let me tell you yeah. why. Not because of any other reason. Is that they now know that they could create more. Right. Well, why, why, if you're abundant, why, abundance to me has changed. Abundance means I have more than I need, like way more than I need. So if I have way more than I need and I know how to create it, then take it. I'll create more of it. So now you're no longer holding on in scarcity. You're making a difference. So wealthy people that have created a lot of wealth in this work, they want to give back. They want to make a difference. And I think that that's how we're innately wired. Mm -hmm. I think we're all innately wired to care for one another, yeah, to make a difference. In the living organism, our living organism, our community, we heal one another, that's what we do. Right. We inform one another, we encourage one another, we support one another, we shine for one another, not to outshine another person, to shine to show them that they can shine, and that's, that to me is super healthy. Mm -hmm. So then I'm, I'm applauding your success because I want you to succeed because you're telling me that if you can do it, I can do it. So, right. so there's no longer any separation. I think that's hopeful for the world. Then you start celebrating diversity. Then you're like, wow, you're way different than me. I wanna, I wanna study you because I wanna bring that into who I'm becoming. 95% of our life is coming from those programs. Uh, and if you understand that, then there's an opportunity to see the programs and also to rewrite the programs, which is where freedom comes from. And so so how, how, do we, how do we see the programs first then? Okay, easy, you ready? Yes. Your life, 95% is coming from the program. So you look at your life right now and recognize all the things that you like that come into your life, they come in because you have programs to acknowledge those things. But the things that you strive for, wish for, work hard for, put effort into it, sweat over, you know, it's like, I'm going to make it. I'm working on it. I go, <laughs> why are you working so hard? And the answer inevitably is whatever program you've got doesn't support that destination. And then you are going to try to use your conscious awareness to override the program. Uh, and um, that's not a very successful approach. <laughs> so should, should we not be working so hard? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, if you understand how it works, you don't have to work so hard. That's the whole beautiful part about it. But, you know, there's a whole phrase, uh, knowledge is power. That's been around a thousand years, knowledge is power. I want to rephrase it that more personal in our world today is a lack of knowledge is a lack of power. And what mm -hmm. we don't know about how we work that has disempowered us from taking control <laughs> of how we work. Uh, right. And the, the idea of taking control, let me, let me emphasize something very clear to begin with. Quantum physics as a, as a science is perhaps the most valid of all sciences because the theoretical ideas have almost all been materialized in the research. And I go, so what's important? I go, primary number one principle, ready? Consciousness is creating our life experiences. I go, what does that mean? I said, we are creators. That's quantum physics. Uh, and, and the idea about that, then I look at people and I go, well, how's your creation going here? <laughs> you know, and it's like, it's not really going very well. I said, but you're the creator. And it's like, well, no, I feel like the victim. And I go, lack of knowledge is a lack of power. That's where it comes mm. So. Should I talk about the programming? I think that might be yes, helpful. Please. To begin yes, please. It's a very simple understanding because the brain is an information processor, a computer. It's exactly what it is. And now that we have so much familiarity with the uh, silicon-based computer, this carbon-based computer in here has the same 
fundamental mechanisms. They both use the same thing. So let's go back in the old days, for example, when um, uh, before they put programs in your computer, you could go buy a brand new computer, come home, push start, boots up, screen lights up. I say, now do something. And you go, can't do anything. I say, got a brand new computer. You go, not until I put programs in the computer can I use the computer. Mm -hmm. Right. So the idea is in the last trimester of pregnancy, a fetus brain lights up, screens on, but it can't do anything until programs come in. And so the first seven years of a child's life, the brain is functioning at a vibration. And let me just emphasize vibration because what was that? Uh, you put wires on a person's head, it's called electroencephalograph, and you can read brain function. But the functions are in vibrational frequencies, okay? Uh, the lowest frequency is delta, that's sleep. The highest frequency, well, it's called gamma, that's peak performance. Uh, and then one that we're almost always in is beta, which is thinking, schoolroom, focused consciousness. When you go home at night from that beta thinking process, you relax, then the vibrations even slow down a bit more. And then you're in alpha, which is calm consciousness. And then the moment you fall asleep, the moment you just lost it, you're gone. Your brain is in now a lower vibration called theta. Well, a child's life is in theta for the first seven years. I go, so what does it represent? Theta is hypnosis. Mm. I go, why, why should the child's brain be in hypnosis? And the answer is, that's how it got programs. Uh, you know, there's, uh, it just observes. Watch your father, watch your mother, watch your family, community. You're observing them like a video recorder. And whatever behavior they're experiencing, you are downloading that kind of behavior. Why? You want to be a member of the family and community. You got to follow the rules. And so what are the rules? Observe them, download them. Unfortunately, there's no uh, filter device, meaning good stuff gets downloaded, bad stuff gets downloaded. There's right. no filter to say good or bad. It's all getting downloaded, okay? So I say, why are we downloading these behaviors? And the answer is you need the fundamental behaviors to be the member of a family and a community, and these are programs. And you copy people, and I go, well, okay, so your subconscious is like a hard drive in a computer. It's got programs in it. And uh, the subconscious is strictly that. And a lot of people think, oh, that's the evil comes from subconscious. And I go, subconscious is a hard drive, just like in your computer. Is your computer hard drive evil? <laughs> you know, it's no, it's yeah. a device. The it's receiving information. Yeah. yeah, but it's the programs you put in there could be good or bad. That's So I'll give you a good program. Uh, when did you learn how to walk? Before you were two years old. I say, for most people, they can be 102 years old, they're still walking, same program. So those right. programs that come in are pretty fundamental. They can carry us all the way through life. Now, of course, since I said it's not filtered, about 60% of the downloaded programs, behaviors that are in that subconscious are uh, disempowering or self-sabotaging or limiting beliefs we acquired from other people. Did you say 60%? Yeah. 60, which is more than why, 50. Why, why, is, why is there so many limiting uh, programs? Why, why does that happen? Why don't we have 90% you know, uh, positive programs? Because the programming came from people who know that's how you take power of people. If I program mm. you, I have power over you, okay? And the first powers came from simply this. Humans are the only organism that know that they're going to die. No other organism knows it's going to die. Well, this is a stress. <laughs> like, oh, my God, my life will end. Ah, you know, and that freaks out a lot of people. And that whole thing is then the fear of dying. And fear is when you look for somebody to help you get over the fear. You don't if you're in fear, you don't look for yourself. <laughs> you're the one that's the, the victim, more or less. And you're right. looking for somebody to help. I feel like a lot of people are overwhelmed, stressed, and anxious and are in fear based around the topic of money. They don't 100%. understand it. They don't have enough of it. They don't know how to manage it. They don't want to lose it. They, yeah. You know, all these different fears. What do you think are the core differences, different beliefs between someone who is wealthy or in an abundance with money versus someone who is financially poor and struggling with money? This is the, the whole subject of a very important book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. And it goes back to everything I said. It's the programming in the first seven years of your life that you're going to run that life from. Mm. 
The program is observing other people. If your father was well off and well to do, then you unconsciously downloaded the behavior to manifest what he was manifesting. But if you come from a poor family and all you talk about is struggle and we can't get there and it's so hard and life is trouble and blah, 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 you downloaded that one. I say, so most of us did not come from the rich family one. Okay. Right. And that means most of us do have a concern about what if I don't have the money? You know, I can't get health care. I can't get food. I can't, where am I going to sleep? I, homeless people, where do they come from? You know? Uh, and so the significance about all this is if you're concerned about the money, you're concerned about the fact that your programming said you're not successful, that you're not going to make it. This is a rat race. That's Darwinian theory, which has screwed us big time because it's false. And it was based on Darwinian theory. It's a struggle for survival based on competition, winner, loser competition, you know? And I said, that is completely not the drive force of evolution. It's actually the 180 degrees opposite drive force. Uh, give a simple point. A garden is not a battleground. By definition, a garden is everybody's cooperating. Then we come into the garden, evolve, and then guess what? We turned it into a battleground. And guess what? <laughs> now we're facing an extinction because we're destroying the ecosystem that provides for us. So uh, the point was this. Battleground was never built into the system. It was acquired. People seeking power over each other, uh, you know, uh, and it started with force. The first power is force. <laughs> you don't want it my way? <laughs> Now you do it my way. And, uh, and that was the first power that came in. And, and people are living under a misbelief that life is a struggle. And if they don't go out there in that rat race and compete like all the other rats out there, they're going to not make it. So guess what? Everybody's out on a you know competition bent. And the unfortunate part, here's a sports person, sir. The definition of competition is not the one we're using today. That's an inaccurate definition. The way we look at competition, that's a winner-loser conflict. You know, whether it's two sports team, winner-loser, whatever it is. Okay. But no, the original definition of competition to strive together. Mm, really? What does that mean? It says you want to be a tennis player. Don't play the weaker person. You're not going to learn anything from him. Play the, the more powerful person. Why? It's a competition, but what was the point? I'll do better if I learn by playing from the, the better player than if I learn from the weaker player. Right. So that kind of competition isn't winner loser. Both people win. The guy who's better won the game. The other guy wins. Why? Now I got better, you know, technique. So uh, we live in a winner loser competition, which is uh, leads to violence and struggle and war and all that other like that. Uh, not recognizing Evolution says, get back into the garden, man. Why? Right. Everything is cooperating in the garden. <laughs> we are not. Right, right. Yeah. What would be the, the, the reprogramming that you would share with someone who's, who grew up like a majority of people, maybe who didn't have like the wealthiest parents and they were programmed that, you know, money is the root of all evil or it's hard to make money or, yeah. or we never have enough to buy what we want. Well, that, that's there, the negative a, programming. That's the one yeah. that keeps you poor all the time. What would, be, what would be the new script to reprogram? And and how effective would it be for someone to do this right before they go to sleep with the new script? Well, any, yeah, anything that you put in your mind consciously before you go to sleep is still lingering in there as you go to sleep. So it's like fomenting <laughs> inside. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the, the, I think that the very first thing is this. Even before the money, I said, what was the first one? I said, you have to love yourself because that means you will take care of yourself. And people don't love themselves. They don't take care of themselves. And you know that. You've seen people yeah. physiologically fall apart in front of your face because they don't take care of themselves. Why? They, they make poor choices with their nutrition or working out. or Everything's not relevant. Yeah. But if they have a pet, oh, man, my pet's going to get the best food. My pet's going to get the best health care. I'm going to you know, take care of this pet. Do they take care of themselves? Not as good as they take care of the pet <laughs> right away. There's your problem. So number one is first identify you love yourself because then everything you do after that will be supporting your love. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh -huh. Then deservability. I do not deserve. Why? Well, that's what I was programmed. I'm not smart enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not wealthy enough. I'm not beautiful enough, whatever. I go, huh. 
you better start to programming. I deserve X. I deserve Y. Okay. Not I will mm. deserve. I deserve. <laughs> right. But, uh, again, I just want to emphasize that because any futurism in a subconscious mind doesn't work because subconscious doesn't see future. It just sees the moment. Mm -hmm. So if you record, I will be wealthy, I will be healthy. Uh, I say, when's that going to happen? I go, well, put it in the record. We'll come back next year, Lewis, and let's push the button. And it says, I will be healthy. And I go, you're still not there. Yeah. <laughs> can't get there because I never said you were there. You're, you're only in a want. <laughs> you can't get there. So the idea is that's why everything go back to it has to be in the present tense. I am healthy. I am wealthy. I am this and I am lovable. You know, so that's really important. That's if, if you don't do that right, then but you can always reprogram. That's the beautiful part. I, oh, sure. I put it up. Well, then reprogram it again. You can do yeah. it. How important is it for people to learn to heal the past then so that they can love themselves in the now as opposed uh, how, to be taught? Oh, to heal the past? Yes. You will automatically start doing that when you start loving yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and let me give you something because I had to learn a lot, a lot. You know, I learned some rules. I, you know, I had all these principles. Then I had to walk the talk, and I learned some rules. One of the, one of the most important rules is, is to let go of after it's happened, and you had it's like, why am I carrying this around? You know, because it's interfering with my future. If I have the filter of between me in the future, it's like, I'm not going to get there at some point. Letting go. And it's funny, I'm not a religious guy. I'm a spiritual person. But religion is somebody making up rules for you. <laughs> I go, no, we, we are directly connected with source. There, nobody's going to interfere with that. Okay. So, but, but it was really important to, to uh, uh, recognize this character for a very important reason, because it says you are more than this right here. Mm -hmm. This is a, this is, I, I call this a, um, uh, the, the television set. In other words, I'm receiving a broadcast, the Bruce broadcast. Bruce is not in here. That's what I learned in my cells. It's like, oh my God, we're not in here. We're receiving a broadcast because on the surface of your cells, there are antennas called receptors. I said, well, you got receptors. So they were on the surface. What? Eyes, ears, nose, taste, touch. They read the environment. Receptors read the environment. Okay. Well, there's a unique set of receptors that each individual has, and no two people have the same set of these receptors. And they're called, interesting enough, self receptors. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, each person has a set of antennas, but they're different. No two people share the same set. So when you put your cells or an organ into another person's body, their immune system will look at those antennas and go, no, that, that's not us, and then eliminate those cells. That's what the immune system will do, okay? Well, I'm into all this stuff and the receptors and how it's all working, and then all of a sudden I realize, well, wait a minute. The difference between us is just a set of receptors. If we're, I look at your liver cell, I look at my liver cell, I go, 99%. They're doing exactly the same thing. But you have Lewis receptors, I have Bruce receptors. I say, but the receptors are antennas. I say, yeah, and they're on the outside of the cell surface. I go, then where do you think the signal is coming from to go to these receptors? Not inside, outside. I said, oh, holy, each of us is receiving a different broadcast, a frequency somewhere in the environment. And in the quantum physics term, we talk about energy fields. That's what they talk about. In spiritual terms, we talk about spirit, which is what? An energy field, that each of us has our own energy field. Well, the, that was the moment of transition in my life. Mm. First thing I said is, oh my God, I'm not in here. I'm the broadcast <laughs> that's being picked up here. I'm not in here. This is, that's where the analogy, this is a TV set that you're watching, Lewis, is playing the Bruce show right now. Yes. And when you're watching a TV and it breaks, you say, TV is dead. I go, yeah, it's not working anymore. Question, is the broadcast still there after the TV is broken? The answer, of course it is. How do you know? I said, get another TV, tune it to the station, you're back on again. I go, exactly. We are not in here. We are receiving a broadcast that no mm. two people get the same broadcast. And I go, and what about that? I go, the broadcast is here whether you're here or not. 
uh, uh, and then all of a sudden I, because uh, I wasn't spiritual, zero, how much, zero, Bruce had zero spiritual until he saw this. And then he said, oh my God, my identity is not built in. My identity is a broadcast. That means if my television breaks, my television's dead, but my broadcast is still there. Mm-hmm. And it can be picked up by another embryo with the same set of antennas if it shows up and I'm back. And all of a sudden it's like all this mystical stuff started going, oh my God, this is real. <laughs> this is totally real. And the most important thing, I lost the fear of death instantly. Mm. I just said, I'm not, a, this is not a, a, a believe in spirituality. This is a mechanism of spirituality. I go, therefore, if I die, I'm still here as a spirit, you know? And it's like the fear of death, which is the number one fear we started with, number one fear that all people have because only humans know they're going to die. And then we bought religion stories and paid for these stories. And they told you what you can do and what you can't do. And it's a bunch of, actually, there are good things to learn, but they're also there. They take away your power. They give you something and they also take away your power. And, and then came to me the big story. And all of a sudden when I realized, oh my God, I'm a broadcast and a television set. And I said to myself, why have a body? Why not just be the spirit? My cells come up with a question. You ready? If you're just a spirit, Bruce, what does chocolate taste like? Mm-hmm. That's so deep. You have to I'm give you another five minutes to put that one in there. <laughs> and, down with it. and the reason is this. Our perceptions of our physical experiences, mm-hmm. you know, anything from sight, smell, sound, touch, taste, love is a feeling. That's physiology. The body is translating the environment into sensations which are broadcast back to source. So I came here to experience. I go, yeah, but I also came here because I can move around and create. And then all of a sudden, the big one, boom, hit me right in the head there, Lewis. I said, what was it? I said, oh my God, people think you die and go to heaven. I go, no, you were born into heaven. Why? Mm. What's your vision of heaven? Well, here it is. You're the creator. Manifest it. Oh, my God. We can manifest heaven. I go, people fall in love. They all of a sudden feel, yeah, that's heaven. That was really great. (laughs) I go, well, you manifested that. And all of a sudden, I realize, oh, my God. People are so lost thinking, well, if I just be okay, I'll have heaven when I'm dead. And I'm going, no, I think you missed it, folks. (laughs) This is heaven. If you understand how to get out of the program, then you become the manifester of the program, then heaven is a way of life right here, right now for all of us. When we grow up, and it's especially important uh, in regard to health, most people, I just say most families, when somebody's sick, they take, they go to the doctor. Okay, I go, great. So you're a kid, you see mommy go to the doctor, daddy goes to the doctor, and then you go to the doctor. I say, why are you going to the doctor? And the answer is, it's about your health. I say, yeah, but what's the point? You ready? You don't know anything about your health, but they do. Right. So all of a sudden, you seek their advice. And I go, well, then their words become your truth because you have no other truth but what they said. And all of a sudden, then you become a victim uh, in your biology, according to the program, because the program said your life is controlled by genes. I go, so what does that mean? I go, well, as far as I know, I didn't pick them and I can't change them if I don't like the character. And they turn on and off by themselves. Victim, what? Heredity. I, I got genes. It's not my life. It's my genes. And then right. If my gets- if my grandparents had a heart attack, then I'm susceptible to this and, and onward and onward. Exactly. And cancer. You know, it's like, oh, I got cancer running in the family. Oh, there must be genes. And then the genes. And would I get that gene? I'm going to get cancer. Then I'm the victim. And the fear <laughs> goes on and on and on, uh, except for an interesting fact. There is no gene that causes cancer. There's not one mm. gene that causes cancer. Cancer is associated with a disharmony. And so let's say, the, the, especially for women, they're very much uh, concerned about the breast cancer gene, BRCA gene. The only thing is 50% of the women that have the breast cancer gene never get cancer. Mm. I say, so what's the meaning of that? I say, possession of the gene doesn't cause cancer. It's the, right. the lifestyle that's in disharmony that causes the cancer. The gene just supported it. And now we know 90% of cancer comes from people who have no cancer in their family. 
Interesting. Well, then where'd the cancer come from? Lifestyle is manifesting cancer and you can change your consciousness and you can change cancer. But uh, people believe they're victims. And, uh, and right. if you believe you're a victim, you give up your power. Remember that victim means mm. I have no power. And then I say, well, who has power? Well, over my spirit, the church has the power, and they tell me what to do. Over my health, the medical doctor has the power, they tell me what to do. And my life becomes shaped by those opinions that are not even mine. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, uh, and this is the point. It's like, well, when do you think you're going to become powerful? And I go, well, how about when you find out you are a spirit and you can never be disconnected from source? Nobody can disconnect you from source. There's no such thing as hell, <laughs> you right. know, and health. Uh, what do they know? In fact, in the United States, the third leading cause of death in the United States is called iatrogenic illness. First is heart disease. Second is cancer. And third is a uh, result of medical treatment, iatrogenic illness. Interesting. Interesting. So medicine is the third leading cause of death. I would, you know, so consciousness, I'd go... Maybe I shouldn't follow their prescriptions. So much. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Once again, you know, we experience our life uh, according to our beliefs. And some people have uh, better luck than others. And uh, some people work so hard, but they're getting minimum wages. Mm -hmm. So you have to find uh, your place, your seat.